Having said those things and asked for those prayers, I invite you now to take a minute and let's ask God to open up his word for us. God, I know that if we're going to get anything out of this, it has to come from you. And so I ask that you would keep me out of your way, that you would speak through me to all of us who are here, that we might hear from you. Amen. I, I am excited. Tom's right. I, I, don't, I don't know that there's much I do that I'm not excited about. Usually if I can't get excited about it, that's a good reason for me to avoid doing it. Um, but th this idea of salt and light, I was, I was saying to somebody, you know, I've been doing this thing for like 30 years. And, and even before I was in ministry, I think, I think I've always been interested in motivating people in leadership and trying to figure out what that wor how that works. And, and one thing that I know for certain is that when we don't have a vision, when I don't know what tomorrow is supposed to look like, all I can do is wander in today. And I've encountered way too many effective, compassionate people who don't have a vision, a, a vision about what the world can be like, about what their world can be like, about the impact that they can make, because you, don't, you make a difference. You can make a difference in the world. You don't have to be a preacher. You don't have to be anything other than yourself if you have a vision. You know what a vision is? A vision is simply an image, not of tomorrow, that, that's foretelling. A vision is an image of a preferred future. A preferred future, which means we're not just going to let the status quo be what it is. We're here to make a difference. That's why Jesus died. That's why he rose again. That's why the bishop appointed me here to New Leaf, because I have an opportunity, a responsibility to make an impact. If tomorrow, if our future isn't in some way superior to today, then what are we, worried? What are we doing? What are we doing if we don't have a vision, a preferred future? That's sometimes hard to wrap our mind around. But vision has to be driven by mission. Why are we here? Now, our mission is outstanding. It's got three parts to it. Love God, love others, and make disciples. I have to admit to you, I've struggled with the idea of making disciples for 10 years. Well, actually 12 years as a pastor. I don't know what it, I don't, I have not found a way to communicate that. But I do know this. I know how to love God. And I know you do too. And I know how to love others. And I know you do too. And more importantly, Jesus showed us how to love God and how to love others. And what happens is this. When we do those things, when we pay attention to those things, we end up making disciples because it's not nearly as complicated as I seem to want to make it. Yes, it's hard to explain, it's hard to describe, except if you listen to what Jesus says. Check this out. Matthew chapter 5. Now this section comes early in Matthew's gospel, all right? <clears throat> this comes after Jesus has been in the desert. He has been tempted by Satan. He's come out of the desert. So now he is full on into his mission. And the first thing he starts doing is calling disciples. Come, follow me. We read in Matthew chapter 4. This isn't part of the text for this morning yet. Matthew chapter 4, 19. Come, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Gosh, that starts to sound like disciples, making you fishers of men. And then we get to the Beatitudes. And he said that crowds were gathering. He went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them, saying, now, his disciples, this is the beginning of Matthew's gospel. Jesus hasn't healed a single person. He hasn't done one miracle. They only know about his reputation, that he was baptized. They've heard about what he's done. He's been in the desert. He's come out. He's recognized as somebody that has sent, been sent from God but they've done nothing with him. He's done nothing in their presence, and they're already called disciples. And so here's the thing. You can be a disciple by showing up. Showing up. And that's what we're going to ask you to do is in the next, the next several weeks, we're going to ask you to start showing up. This is not going to be easy. This is a, this is a rubber meets the road series. I'm going to expect of you, I'm going to demand of you, 
that you be honest with yourself. And if there's stuff that you want to do and haven't been able to because, because your will has been in the way or because resources have been in the way or whatever thing it is, that we look for a way to get, ra- get rid of that roadblock and let all of us own the truth, which is by showing up here, you are being disciples. I don't know what you know. I don't know where your faith is right now, but I can tell you this. If you're in this room at this moment, if you're listening to this online, watching this live, or watching this 10 years from now, what you're doing it makes a difference in this world. You make a difference by showing up. The disciples are called disciples before they've learned anything. They just show up. They're open. They're willing to listen to what this guy has to say because they believe that if they pay attention to Jesus, they can see a preferred future. Life can be better. And folks, when people ask us why we do what we do, if we can't show them that life can be better living for Christ, then we're not being honest because that's not good news. It isn't good news to tell you what rules you might break if you do this or don't do that. It isn't good news to tell you about guilt. Newsflash, we are aware that we are guilty. Guilt, pain, that burden is something I I think that parents especially bear in ways that is outsized. The world doesn't need to know what they might be guilty of if they do or don't do a thing. Salt and light. That's the first part of what Jesus says to these folks who were gathered. These are potential followers. They don't even have names yet. They're just the disciples, this group of people. Potential followers. Listen to what he says. This is after he gives the the series of blessings, the Beatitudes, which we're not going to look at this morning Chapter 5 of Matthew, starting at verse 13. This you, hear this, this you includes you. Because the folks that heard this the first time, the group that heard this the first time, when these words came out of our Savior's mouth, it was everybody who listened. It's not an elite group. They're not trained. They're not qualified. They're not named. They're not sent. They got nothing other than they're paying attention. So if you're paying attention, it applies to you. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled by men. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill can't be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds. And here it is. This is it. This is the preferred future peace. And give praise to your Father in heaven. When we are salt and light, we are conduits. Because here's the deal. A couple of things that I want to point out about salt and light that we'll look at over the next six weeks. If we look at salt to begin with, It has a couple of qualities. First of all, believe it or not, salt is used to preserve, isn't it? It keeps food, keeps meat especially from going bad. So salt can be a preservative. And it's not so much about preserving our lives for the future, although there's that bit of eternity to it. But let's think about this. Salt can protect those who are weak. Those who need someone else to stand by them. Those that need to be a voice. The ones who can't speak for themselves. Jesus says, you are salt of the earth. You have a role. Part of your role is to protect. Another thing that salt does, and I love this, is it adds flavor. I remember when my father-in-law mistakenly believed that he had to stop eating things with any salt whatsoever in them in order to stay healthy because he was willing to do whatever he could to stay healthy. And he exercised and everything else. But I remember he sat down with me once and he said, you know what? Soup without salt is not worth eating. (laughs) Amen. Salt adds flavor. It makes life interesting. We are not to be a part of this world that just kind of like cardboard boxes along the road. We're supposed to make a difference. You have a gift. You have a personality. There is something about you that is not true of anyone else. And you know what? God did that on purpose. Don't apologize for who you are. Allow the truth of who you are. Doug, I got to say this, Tom, 
you're not embarrassed. You're, not, you're going to embarrass him. He's not going to embarrass you. This is the way it works with kids. We, our parents, this is just the truth. Our parents don't embarrass us. We embarrass them. And we started a long time ago. So, but, he, but you're a beautiful guy. Be yourself, right? Salt adds flavor. You don't have to apologize for being different. You have to celebrate that truth of who you are and what that means in, in your life. Because you have a vision and a message to give to people that no one else has. And if you don't share your vision, if you don't share your passion, if you don't put your salt in the lives of other people, they're missing out. You're irreplaceable in the sense of your contribution. Now, Jesus' mission, it's gonna happen because it doesn't rely on us to be a success. It involves us. But Jesus said, I'm gonna build this thing and nothing can stop me. So it's not about we're going to make it fail. It's not about us doing something wrong. It's about us getting the excitement and the joy of being the flavor in somebody else's life. But here's the other piece. The critical thing about salt, your body can't survive without sodium. There's two things absolutely essential to your life, two things that keep you functioning. One is the impulses of your nerves, all of that information that has to go back and forth, without sodium, that information doesn't get transmitted and your life is done. We don't survive without that sodium in our systems. The other thing that it does is it provides, helps us keep the right balance of fluids so we're not dehydrated or puffed up. It helps us balance the fluids in our bodies so that we have the right blood pressure and we have the right amount. You know, we're made out of water, but we can still, we can still have too much. So salt provides for us something that is absolutely essential to life. And you know what else? It is not its value. The value of salt is not based on scarcity, which is the way we base value of most things, right? Gold's more expensive because there's less of it. That's not true with salt. Salt's value is intrinsic. It matters to anybody and everybody in exactly the same way. Having more salt doesn't make you wealthier. Having less salt means you need something, but as soon as you have as much as you need in your system, as soon as salt is doing its thing, that's it. You're at a stable place. Salt is an essential place for us to be stable and effective and make an impact in the world. Jesus says, you are the salt of the earth. And then he says, you're the light. Beautiful thing about light. Let's think about it. One of the things that light can do is show you the right path, right? Show you the right path. And with the car that we're driving now, that, that Lexus, we bought it used, it has privacy tent. And I have to, at night, have to roll down the windows to know where to turn because it's dark enough. Sometimes I'm getting older, admit that. Sometimes I need to put down the window because I need to see where the turn is. Like, I don't really want to turn into a ditch. I mean, I might want to turn into a ditch, but if I'm going to do that, I want to do it on purpose with the four-wheel drive on, not by accident at night. We need to see the right path to know where to go. Light is essential to show us the direction, how we must go. The other thing that light does, and this is huge, folks, there's so many of you that do this in your lives. You make a difference to people in ways that you probably don't recognize. I can promise you, I can promise you, if you're a first responder, if you're a nurse or anyone in those field taking care of folks, if you're working in a nursing home, home care, that kind of stuff, you're doing this. Light makes life less scary. When you're in the darkness, when your world's falling apart or falling apart or we're confused, you don't know where to go, you don't know what's coming up, you don't know what to do next, light, you don't have to go anywhere. Just knowing that you're not in the dark is such a blessing. And I can tell you, if you show up in somebody's world, if you're a police officer or a medic, if you're a nurse or a doctor, if you're somebody who's doing home health care, if you're working in hospice, if you're visiting neighbors, you don't have to have an official title. There's some of you that go out there and knock on doors because you haven't seen somebody in a while. And when you do that, you're being light of the world. You're letting somebody who is alone and in the darkness of that. The lights can be on in the house, but that's not the same. There is a comfort to light. When you're not alone, it isn't as scary. 
And that's an essential part of who we're called to be. That's a preferred future that I can wrap my arms around. Let's make this world less scary to be in. If you're a two-year-old or a 20-year-old or an 80-year-old, let's make the world less scary. Let's try to make it a place where you get an idea how to go safely and how to be not afraid, just for a short time, just for a little bit. Let's make people not afraid. I grieve that too much of the history of the church has brought fear to people's lives because they think they're not good enough, or they think they've done the wrong thing, or they think they'll never measure up, or all kinds of other things. But the truth is, we are not called to point out people's fault. I've said this before, and I'll say it till the day I die. Folks, you know what's wrong with you. What you don't know is how to get out of it, how to fix it, what to do differently. Sometimes it's because you don't really see clearly what's messed up and you don't know what to change if you could change something. Sometimes it's you know what to change and you're overwhelmed by it. You don't want to take that chance because it's risky. It's safer to stay in a constant known disaster than take one step toward the uncertain future. We stay in a status quo that is full of pain because it's more, more frightening to step out of it. But if there's somebody beside you who is being salt and light in your world, if there's somebody who stands beside you and says, you know what, I know it's frightening. I'll be there with you. One step, one step out of the darkness and the frustration and the fear into the place of hope, one step in the company of another makes all the difference in the world. I could preach a million sermons. I probably have. No, not that many. Lynn's her well, if you count all the ones that I've preached to Lynn and the rest of the family, probably close to a million. <clears throat> all of the preaching in the world doesn't accomplish anything if someone doesn't stand in the darkness with another and let them know that it's going to be okay. Light gives us a source, a path, the direction. It also gives us comfort in the darkness. And the third thing that's true about light, and this is, again, the biological reality, without light, we wouldn't be here. Because the only source of energy, the only way that all of these chemicals and everything that make up this universe, the only way that that becomes food and nutrition for us is through light. Yeah, it's a really long process, and I've oversimplified it, but if you turn out the lights, we're going to starve to death. That's the bottom line. Light is an essential source of power and most of all nutrition for us. If there isn't light, folks, we're in deep trouble. Salt and light. That's what Christ says to those who are beginning to listen to him. They don't even know that he's going to die yet. He says, long before Easter, and he sets out his agenda. He says, listen, if you're here listening to me, you are the salt of the earth, you are the light of the world. And then he starts talking about how some of the rest of that looks. Here's what I want to say to you. I want to ask you to take a chance over the next year. I want you to just simply ask yourself if you're willing to do this, if you're willing to look at the way you can be salt and light, because I will tell you this, you're doing way more of it than you recognize. One of Satan's great tools is to distract. And Satan distracts us by making us think that something that we're doing isn't adequate or that we aren't doing enough. I will tell you on Sundays, any one of you who comes up and says something to me personally, it's a huge blessing to me because I like being reminded that I'm a human being on Sunday mornings. Yes, I have a role and I, I, I love what I do, but when, that, when, when, when the Sunday morning routine gets broken and somebody like, Judy Griffith shows up after she's been AWOL for, I don't know, eight months or something like that. It was way too long, Judy. That's all I have to say. Just, just seeing folks that come back from, from, this, from the horrible life in the South without snow. I don't want to be there. I pray for you guys all the time. Just saying hello makes a difference. It really does make a difference. If you, it, when, when people come in this building on Sunday morning, I'm telling you, they don't know what's going on with all of you. And that's a good thing. Salt and light. Being that in the lives of others. Allowing God to use us. And then we begin to give the world a sense of what the other 363 days look like. 
Because I think the world knows what Christmas and Easter are about. We talk about that. And that this series is about that. This is about what the other 363 days look like in our lives. What does it look like on the day after Christmas and the day after Easter and every day after that? Are we allowing people to understand what it means to have more love? Loving God more, loving others more. That's, I think we can put our arms around what it looks like to have more love. I think if we ask the question, in your world, what would it look like if there was more love? I think if you ask the question, in my life, is there a way that I can share more love with others? Is there a way that I can live a, a life that is more dedicated to loving God and not just doing, but actually loving God, just taking time? Every time I hear somebody praise a sunset or a sunrise or something they've seen, folks, you need to understand that's an act of love because God gave us beauty as a love gift. This place could be black and white and it wouldn't change our purpose at all. All the colors and all the joy and all the music and everything else, that's icing on the cake because God loves us. And when we know that God loves us, it's easier for us to share others share with others how God can love them as well. Because I can tell you, I, I'm not God's gift to anything, but it's easier for me to look in the mirror and say, honestly, God loves you, Russ. That means there's hope for anybody else. And I don't mean that, I don't, that sounds facetious, and there is, there can be that sort of laughing part of it. And I say it laughingly oftentimes, but at a soul level, I know who I am. I know everything that I think. I know everything that I do. I know all of my motivations. And I'm not perfect. I'm far from it. But I can look in the mirror and say, by golly, I matter to God, and he loves me as I am. And he's not going to leave me this way because he knows what my future can be. Because he gives me a vision, a preferred future. It doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter how long you've lived. So there's my invitation. Come with us for the next six weeks, and let's try to figure out what the other 363 days look like. Let's pray. It's up to you, God, to guide us, to encourage us, to remind us how much you have prepared for us to be a part of that disciples can be just those who are willing to stand at the feet of Jesus and pay attention to what he has to say. We don't have to be teachers or preachers or anything else if we're just open to letting you work in our lives and if we're willing to take on that amazing privilege of being salt and light in this world. We thank you and praise you for the work you do in and through us. Amen.